Okay, g'day all, welcome to another video. Um, so, first things first, uh, thank you very much to all my Patreon supporters, and we've reached our goal, so I'll begin a direct 3D video series soon. Uh, that should be really, really cool. Uh, but I did want to go through this video first. Um, the other thing is, if anybody's near Sydney on about July, the 1st, 2nd and 3rd, I'm going to be performing in the Bundanoon Winterfest. Yeah, so come along if you want to hear some music, eat some food, and uh, just enjoy winter in Sydney. Um, alrighty, so the topic for today is implementing a semaphore. Um, yeah, we've got a fair bit to get through, so let's just get started. Uh, semaphores are a parallel programming primitive. Uh, they were, or they are used to create mutexes and divvy out shared resources. They solve a lot of problems in uh, parallel computing. They were invented by Edsger Dijkstra, who was really one of the biggest names in computer science and one of the biggest champions ever, in my opinion. Um, alrighty, so today's vid, uh, it's not about how to use a semaphore so much. Uh, what we're talking about mostly today is how to implement one in, uh, in assembly and C++ as well. Um, we're in user mode at the moment, so we're not writing an operating system and that does mean that I'm going to actually be using pretty heavily too um, Windows function calls. Yeah, so this won't help necessarily if you're trying to write uh, a semaphore from scratch for your own operating system, but you know, it might give you some pointers. Um, yeah. Um, and a bit of a disclaimer, yeah. Um, only write your own semaphore if, if you have to. And um, particularly this semaphore here, I'd hate to think that somebody is using this code in production um, code. Yeah, if somebody uses this semaphore in production code, they're crazy. Uh, because it's got very little error checking and it's it's fairly limited in scope. Um, yeah, if you're writing an operating system, you know, sure, write your own semaphore, but otherwise it's generally much safer, a better idea to use whatever semaphores and parallel primitives are provided by your environment. Okay, so the plan for today, well, we're going to go through a bunch of little rules, uh, 14 steps. I don't know why I called them rules. Let's just pretend I didn't for a second, shall we? Uh, once we've implemented all of the steps, we're going to have ourselves a working semaphore, fingers crossed. Uh, I'm using assembly, but I've also provided the rules in pseudocode. So hopefully if you've got, you know, a language that can do atomic instructions, this uh, bit test and set sort of thing, um, you might be able to implement your own semaphore and have a play around in a higher level language. Uh, the code so far, okay, so I've pre-coded a bunch of stuff. It just, it's 200 lines worth of code and I didn't want to program it live. So yeah, I pre-coded this stuff. Let's, let's have a bit of a look. Uh, the main crux of it is this test barrier just here, but if we come down to main, uh, so there's three files of code here. Yeah, we're going to be adding code to this uh, creelsemaphore.asm file in a second. Uh, but the main method, when the program runs, um, it creates some number of threads, creates a couple of semaphores. Um, this test program here is a barrier. Yeah, I've taken it straight from Robert Downey's little book of semaphores. Um, that's a free ebook. Go and find it if you like. Full of interesting puzzles uh, using semaphores. Um, we're making a barrier here to test our program, as per Robert Downey. Um, so for the barrier in uh, Little Book of Semaphores, you need uh, a counting semaphore, which I've called barrier, and you also need a mutex, which I've called mutex. Uh, this is not a spin lock mutex. Yeah, this will be a mutex made with a semaphore. So yeah, it's interesting really, but it's not a it's not a it's not a spin lock mutex. Although we'll see that semaphores actually have spin locks in them. Um, alrighty, so if the if the two semaphores allocate OK, we come down here and we create 10 threads and send them to that test barrier up here. And once they're done, we just clean up. Um, so the main crux of this test program here is the test barrier. So the, the idea here is that all 10 threads have to arrive at this line just here and state that they've arrived at the barrier. Uh, then once all 10 have arrived, um, the last thread to arrive will say all of the threads have arrived. And after that, all of the threads will proceed through the barrier. So the point of a barrier is that all of the threads have to collect together before proceeding. Yeah, that's what we're trying to test here. And as we'll see in just a moment, um, presently it doesn't work because our semaphore is not written. Now, if we move over here to creel semaphore.h, uh, we'll just see the header. So I've got uh, a type def up here for creel semaphore. Uh, this is a helper function just here to make um, getting the thread handles easier in assembly. Now, I just didn't want to call this uh, function in assembly, so I wrote a helper function, cheater. <laughs> uh, 
Um, these top two functions, um, create semaphore and delete semaphore, I've written already. And these two down here are the ones that we're going to write. Yeah, signal and wait. So if we come over to assembly and have a bit of a look at the uh, code so far. So the top part of the file is just a few external functions. Uh, these top five are standard Windows functions for, well, just doing different things, allocating memory, freeing memory, um, sleeping a thread and waking them up. Uh, this one just here is the get thread handle. That's the helper function that I wrote just here. And after that, I've got my semaphore structure. So I think I think we'll explain the semaphore structure in just a moment. Uh, but Creole create semaphore just allocates memory. Yeah, it allocates enough for all of these D words just here in the semaphore structure, plus enough for a circular array, um, which I'm using as a queue. Uh, I'm using a circular array as a queue, which means that when you create a semaphore, you've got to know how big the queue is going to be. Yeah, you've got to know how many threads the semaphore has to put to sleep. Yeah, which is, it's it's a bad design decision, I'll admit. <laughs> um, you could use a linked list if you want, and that would probably be better than uh, this circular array queue just here. Uh, but the reason why I went with a circular array is just because it's faster. Yeah, with a linked list, you call malloc and free all the time whenever you've got to allocate and free nodes. So I don't know. I just went with a circular array. Um, anyway, our semaphore structure allocates the uh, memory for its own D words and that circular array. And that's pretty much all that creates semaphore does. Then it returns the um, pointer to that. And delete semaphore is really, really simple. It just um, calls free yeah, to deallocate whatever RAM the semaphore has. Um, these two functions here are helper functions as well, in queue this thread and DQ next thread. So these are the functions that add a thread's handle to my queue and remove the next thread's handle from my queue. Um, they're helper functions, I say, because they don't use the C calling convention. Yeah, they're just a bit, I don't know, a bit simpler than a regular C function. Um, in queue this thread adds the current thread's handle to the queue of the semaphore at star RCX. So RCX, as we'll see in a minute, is going to always point to the semaphore um, that we're working with. And in queue, this thread just adds the thread's handle uh, that it gets from this function just here uh, to the queue. Yeah, if the queue is full, it, uh, it calls abort and shuts down the whole program with no error. <laughs> Yeah, so that's kind of one of the reasons why you wouldn't use this semaphore in production code. I mean, if there's a mistake and you accidentally add one more thread to the queue, the whole program will just shut down. Um, the other thing is that this function returns the thread's handle in RDX. Yeah, that's a standard Windows thread handle in RDX. Yeah, so that's important. And DQ, this thread just returns the um, next thread's handle in... Um, in the queue, yeah, just you know, removes the next thread from the queue, uh, returns that handle in RAX. Um, if the queue has no threads, this is probably important too. This is you know another tailor-made little helper function, and what I got it to do was if there's no threads in the queue, then you know don't crash or anything. What it does is returns zero as the thread handle. Okay, don't worry so much about those things. It's um, up to you how you implement your queue, but that's the code so far. Okay, so let's move on. So test the program as it stands. Alrighty, so as it stands, we don't, we haven't got our wait and signal functions. Uh, at the moment, they do nothing. So our threads um, in our barrier won't wait for each other. Let's have a look. Uh, there we go. So let's have a bit of a look what happens. So 3584 arrives at barrier, 4080 arrives at barrier, 3020 arrives at barrier. So a bunch of them arrived at the barrier, but then 3584 went through the barrier. Oh, that's not what we want. That's not a barrier. Um, all 10 threads hadn't arrived yet, and thread 3584 saw fit to let itself through the barrier, which is no good, and uh, which is proof that our semaphore is not working. Um, what we want to see is all 10 threads say arrived at barrier. Then we want to see this line down here. All threads have arrived. Then we want to see all of the threads go through the barrier. All right, hopefully we can achieve that. Let's have a look. Let's have a look. Rule number one, a semaphore consists of a counter, a mutex spin lock and a queue. Okay, so that's up here. Counter, uh, spin lock, just there, queue, mutex will be a spin lock. And a queue, so the queue is all of this stuff down here. 
yeah, along with the circular array in uh, in my particular implementation. Rule number two, semaphores allow only two functions, semaphore wait and semaphore signal. Now that's on top of the init and delete functions, which I've already written. Yeah, but these are the two functions down here. So creel semaphore wait and creel semaphore signal. Rule number three, when a thread calls wait, that's this function just here, the very first thing that happens is the thread has to grab the mutex. Okay, so that's this mutex up here, Q mutex. Um, there is another mutex over here in the main program. Yeah, this one here to make our barrier, but we're not talking about that. Um, we're talking about this Q mutex here, the mutex that belongs to the semaphore. Okay, so we've got to make a, a spin lock just here. So I might say mutex loop and lock BTS. Um, it's a D word BTR and RCX points to our semaphore. Creel semaphore and dot Q mutex. Okay, so we want to bit test and set bit zero of our mutex and jc to mutex loop. Okay, so this is just a mutex spin lock, exactly the same as we went through in the last vid, and it means grab the mutex. Uh, if you're using another language, that'd probably be quite different, but that's how you do it in assembly. Grab the mutex, good stuff. Rule number four, after the thread grabs the mutex, it decrements the counter. I've called mine count, <laughs> that's good. That's good. Nice bit of mention. Okay, so deke, uh, D word, PTR, RCX. Oh, you have to put that in square brackets. RCX and, oh, wait a minute. It's um, Creel, Semaphore and Count. Okay, this is decrement the counter. Okay, so we decrement the semaphore's counter. A lot of semaphores um, which are allowed uh, a few threads to pass them, you know, not mutexes, but um, a lot of the time they're called counting semaphores because they count up and down with this count just here. Irrelevant, well done. Let's go on to the next slide. <laughs> Uh, if decrement results in count being a negative number, then enqueue this thread's handle. Okay, that's pretty crucial. Um, if decrement results in a negative number. Um, okay, so after the decrement, we want to comp uh, D word PTR and RCX and Creel semaphore uh, count and zero and jump if it's I'll jump if it's greater or equal to finished okay so down here we'll put finished okay so right here this is uh, the count was negative block negativum that's like um let's just get on with it um the count <laughs> the count was negative and block uh, if the counter was uh, less than zero, uh, if it was greater than or equal to zero, then the thread's going to come down here to finished and ret at the moment, although I think we've got to do something else before we ret. Anyway, next, oh, enqueue this thread's handle. Yeah, we forgot to enqueue this thread's handle. Okay, so n q enqueue this thread. Um, okay, so that's this function just here. It's going to add this thread's handle to the queue. Yeah, you notice I didn't make any shadow space or anything. Like I said, it's not the C calling convention. It's just a little helper function. After this thread's handle is added to the queue, release the mutex. Good idea. Okay, so how do you release the mutex? I might just put a release the, release the, release the mutex. So you release the mutex by setting uh, this value just here to zero. So I might just copy that line and mod. Release the mutex. Uh, if you're not sure about these mutex lines just here, um, you can have a look at the previous video. Yeah, we went through making a spin lock mutex and this is, it's exactly the same as what we did then. Uh, okay, so after it's released the mutex, we've got to put ourselves to sleep indefinitely. By ourselves, I mean the, um, the thread. So we better call suspend thread. That's going to be, um, a standard Windows function, so we need some shadow space. Make 28 of it, why not? It seems to be the norm, the going thing. Um, our DX, 
So the, the call to enqueue this thread just here actually puts the thread's ID in uh, RDX. Yeah, so we want to move that to RCX and use it as the uh, parameter to this uh, Windows function, suspend thread. That's just going to put the thread to sleep indefinitely. Um, put the thread to sleep. Okay, what's next? After suspend thread, i.e., i.e., <laughs> when another thread wakes this thread up, the thread returns. How many times can you put thread in a sentence before it stops making sense? I reckon it's two. <laughs> anyway, suspend this thread. So uh, once this thread has been woken up by another thread, yeah, so it suspends itself indefinitely, but another thread can wake it up, as we'll see in a moment. Uh, all we want to do there is ret and continue executing whatever code we were supposed to execute uh, in the barrier. Yeah, that'll actually mean that the threads go through the barrier. Hmm. Okay, that's rule number eight. Rule number nine, if at rule five the decrement did not result in a negative number, did not result in a negative number, then this thread should release the mutex and return. Okay, so that's down here at finished. We're working here with um, mutexes and sleeping threads, and I tell you, we're very, very close to causing deadlock all over the place. Um, yeah, that's kind of why semaphores are fiddly. They're very, very fiddly. You've got to try and uh, remember to release your mutexes all the time. So release the mutex. And we'll put that down here in finished and finally ret. Is that right? Yeah, I think that's right. I think that's right. Actually, I should. Um... Oh, yeah, we got to add RSP20H. That's 2H, buddy. Just. Okay. Um... Deallocate the shadow space. I almost forgot. We'll put your A in there. Deallocate. -y. It doesn't matter. Okay, you've got to remember to deallocate your shadow space after you call this suspend thread. All right, but next rule. So the wait function is finished. Let's move on to the next function, the signal function. This is the second function that semaphores can uh, be used to call or something like that. Uh, the second function that we can call with a semaphore. Um, Whatever. Um, when the thread calls signal, the first thing that has to happen is uh, we grab the mutex. So once again, we grab the mutex. Um, you'll notice that we're grabbing the mutex here uh, in both functions. That's because the uh, the count and the queue of our semaphore, they both have to be uh, mutually exclusive. Only re one thread can have access to those at a time. Otherwise, we get race conditions and uh, terrible things happen. So both of these functions, this semaphore signal and semaphore wait, are critical sections. All right, but grab the mutex, sounds good. So we did that. Uh, after the thread grabs the mutex in the call to signal, it increments the counter. Okay, so uh, inc and d word ptr rcx and it's a creel semaphore and count. Okay, we increment the counter. Sounds good, that's rule 11, nice and easy. Rule number 12, we must be getting somewhere now. How many rules did I say there was? There's tons of them. <laughs> that's it, maybe there's tons of them. After incrementing, check if there's sleeping threads on the queue. DQ the next thread. Yeah, this is a point of confusion just here, but my queue is tailored for this operation. Like I said, it's not a C function, it's just a little helper function, and it actually DQs uh, the next thread, or if the queue is empty, if there's no threads on the queue sleeping, then it just returns zero. Yeah, and by DQ the next thread, I mean take the thread handle off. Yeah, we're working with standard Windows thread handles here. Um, that's good. What's the uh, what what? Uh, after incrementing, check if there's a sleeping threads on the queue. DQ the next thread. Hmm. Okay, so our queue is just going to return zero if there's no thread there, so we can just call DQ, I think. DQ next thread. Yeah, that's it. Oh, 
Oh, who put that tab in there? Okay, DQ the next thread. Um, if RAX at that point is zero, so comp RAX and zero, uh, there were no threads to DQ. The queue was empty, so we don't have to wake up a thread and I might just jump down to no threads to awaken. No threads to awoken. Um, no threads to awaken. Okay, so I might just put a note here. Uh, were there sleeping threads? Um, something like that. DQ the next thread. So handle just here is the supposed handle that the queue returns. So for us, that's going to be RAX. All right. I hope that makes a bit of sense. It doesn't make any sense to me. So <laughs> good luck. Rule number 13. Okay, so we need to wake up a thread that we just DQ'd, but there's trouble. Uh, there's trouble. If we look up here at the way that the threads put themselves onto the queue and then go to sleep, we'll see that it's not actually atomic. Um, right here is the line that the thread enqueues itself, so it adds itself to the queue. And at that point, it's still got the mutex. Yeah, so no other thread can interrupt it. But straight after that, the thread releases the mutex, and it has to because it's about to put itself to sleep. Uh, if the thread goes to sleep with its mutex, then, you know, what are we going to do? <laughs> it's disaster. Um, and after it's released the mutex, it suspends itself or puts itself to sleep. So the point is that another thread might actually try and wake up the thread handle that it read from the queue before that thread has actually put itself to sleep. Um, so what we've got to actually do is um, repeatedly try and wake up the thread until it's, uh, until it's actually fallen asleep. Uh, I hope that makes a bit of sense. So I might make a, a loop head just here. I'll call it... Um, uh, thread was not uh, thread was not asleep yet. Thread was not as leap yet. Is that how you spell asleep? As as leap. It looks weird. Um, all right. Well, we're going to call we're going to call resume thread. So we might want to save our scratch registers to the stack just in case they get written over. So push rax. Um, make some shadow space. Um, that's good. Mob R C X R D X. So once again, the thread's handle is in uh, is in R D X. Thanks to this D Q next thread. No, it's in R A X. Yeah, it's in R A X. The thread's handle is in R A X. And call resume thread. I probably should have documented those functions first. I mean, it's it's terrible form, but what are you going to do? Um, <laughs> Add RSP and 20H. Okay, so that's uh, deallocate the shadow space. Once we call resume thread, and hopefully we've woken up a thread, what we need to do is check if the thread actually uh, woke up. So it's it's a quirk of the, of the Windows resume thread function, but it's a very, very cool quirk. Um, the function actually returns the last state of the thread. So we can tell by looking at RAX, which is what this function returns, we can tell if the thread fell asleep or not. Um, but we don't want it in RAX, we want it in some other function because we need to restore our register RAX. I might move it to RDX. Uh, this would be, uh, was the thread asleep? Was the thread, I'll put, I'll just put sleeping because asleep looks wrong. Um, that's good, so we might just restore our, what was it, RAX and restore our RCX from before. And now we better check if we've actually woken up the thread. So comp rdx and zero. Um, was the thread asleep? So if if rdx is zero, uh, you can have a look at online, the documentation for the resume thread function. But if rdx was zero, then the thread wasn't asleep. And we actually have to try and wake it up again. So I'll jump up here. Um, that's good. Good, that's good. Um, otherwise, if the thread was woken up successfully by this call to resume thread just here, then we can fall through to no threads to awaken. And I think the next should be that. Here we go. We need to wake up the thread we just DQ'd. What? Did I not just say that? Yeah, I did. So I don't know what this text is. This is stupid. Let's just 
There we go. Um, the final thing that we have to do is uh, release the mutex and return. And hopefully at that point we're done. Let me just copy this, release the mutex. Release the mutex. All right, so fingers crossed, I think we've written ourselves a semaphore. Uh, yeah, that should just about do it. So we'll run it and see if the barrier program works. See if all 10 threads arrive at the barrier. Oh, invalid character in file. Oh yeah, that's a comment. You weren't meant to read that, compiler. Uh, okay, so there we go. Let's have a bit of a look. So arrives at barrier. That's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten threads arrive at the barrier, and then one of them says all threads have arrived, and then they all go through the barrier. Beautiful. Looks like we've got ourselves a working semaphore. I might just run it again to test. Uh, yeah, once again, they all arrive at the barrier, and then they all go through. So that's not proof that we've got a working semaphore, but you know, it's a pretty good indication. I think we're done. Yeah, that was fun. Um, if you've got really keen eyes and you spice some problems with my uh, code just here, uh, just leave a comment and maybe I can add an annotation. Or if it, you know, if it's too bad, if my if my code is too buggy, and I'm sure it's it's fairly buggy. If if the code is too buggy, uh, I might just uh, make make another video or not. Uh, anyway, thanks for watching and have a really good day. All right, see ya.